Tonight, as we come to the book of Job, we start at chapter uh, 22, which means that we've completed 21 chapters of the book of Job, which I would remind you just means that we're halfway through. There are 42 chapters to the book of Job. And, And you may feel that you're ready for this discussion between Job and his friends to end. They just kind of go back and forth, running over the same points all over again. Again, just to remind ourselves of the issue here, Job was a man who suffered tremendous catastrophe in his life, very suddenly, very severely. And his friends were convinced that the reason why this catastrophe came upon him was because there was some special or or particular sin in Job's life that God was disciplining him for. And they they said this just based on the principle that no man could suffer so greatly unless God was against him. And if God was against Job, then what he had to do was get right with God, and then he would see his fortunes restored. However, Job knew that he was not a special sinner. Well, he didn't think that he was sinlessly perfect, but he knew that he was an upright, a, a, a blameless man before God. Job knew it. And might I say, God knew it, because in the first chapter of the book of Job, we're told that God knew this about Job, and we know it, being the readers of the book of Job. However, we freely admit that Job's friends did not know this, and they judged Job according to the the measure of, of how things appear in this everyday life. And in Job's particular situation, that was not an accurate judgment to make of him. And so, starting with chapter 22, what we actually have is the third round or the beginning of the third round of speeches between Job and his three friends. We've had each one of the three friends uh, speak. Now, again, I I would remind you that the whole um, cycle of speeches after Job's great catastrophe, after he sat in silence with his friends for seven days saying nothing, it began with Job, right? You remember that from Job chapter three, where he let out this lament, cursing the day he was born and wishing he had died. After that that pain-filled, agonizing cry of chapter three, then his friends in succession began to answer him. First, Eliphaz spoke, and Job answered him. Then Bildad spoke, and Job answered him. Then Zophar spoke, and Job answered him. But that didn't end it. Nothing was resolved. So Eliphaz spoke again, and Job answered him. And Bildad spoke again, and Job answered him. And Zophar spoke again, and Job answered him. That's where we left it off in chapter 21. Now, for a third time, the friends are going to speak. And just so you know, I'm going to sort of tantalize you tonight. I'm going to lead you up to the end of the third round, but we're not going to complete the third round, which is sort of unfair almost. But the third round is short. The third round, Eliphaz speaks, and then Bildad gives what you might call half a speech. If you just thumb through the pages of your Bible and look at Job chapter 25, which we're not going to get to tonight, we're going to start off with that next week. But if you take a look at Job chapter 25, it's the shortest chapter in the whole book. It's six verses. Bildad speaks in the third round, and, and he runs out of steam. He just runs out of energy. It's like they're all exhausted from talking. And Zophar, Zophar doesn't speak at all in the third round. So after chapter 25, then we come into a new phase of the book of Job. Then we come to a section where Job gives a remarkable summary defense. I don't know if you've ever seen this in a courtroom trial where after all the witness has been brought, after all the dispute has been done, after all the cross-examination is made, then each side gets to present its final case. That's what Job does in several chapters. Then one final guy speaks, a guy named Elihu. We'll talk about Elihu when we get to him. And then it's only after Job gives his final defense, Elihu speaks, then the Lord breaks in, in Job chapter 38. So now we're beginning the last of the three rounds of discussion between Job and his friends. Job chapter 22, uh, Eliphaz speaks a last time. Verse 1, then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, Can a man be profitable to God, though he who is wise may be profitable to himself? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous? Or is it gain to him that you make your ways blameless? 
Again, look at it right there in verse 1. He begins with the idea, can a man be profitable to God, though he who is wise may be profitable to himself? Eliphaz has heard all of Job's anguished outpourings to God and seemed to think that Job simply thought too highly of himself. He wondered why Job thought that he was so special. <laughs> Job, are you some big benefit to God? Don't you realize that you're just a man um, like us all? Job's friends thought that those that special rules applied to Job that they that applied to nobody else. And he's trying to defeat that idea in Job and saying, you're not anything special. You're not profitable to God. And again, now he's not simply arguing the case that God is beyond man. Basically, he's saying, Job, there's nothing you can do to please God. As he says right there in verse three, is it any pleasure to the almighty that you are righteous? You see, Eliphaz thought that Job was arrogant and he believed himself to be a special favorite to God because, again, as Job, as Eliphaz accuses Job of thinking, you're so righteous. Eliphaz wanted Job to consider that God needed nothing from him, nothing at all. And Job added nothing to God. Now listen. Just as we've experienced time and time again in discussing the theology of Job's friends, they are mostly correct. In one aspect, Eliphaz certainly did have correct theology. God does not need Job or any of us in the way that we need God. Nevertheless, Eliphaz's application of this principle was wrong in this context. Because look, he says there in verse 3, Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous? And in Job's case, what would you say? Yes, it was. We know this from Job chapters 1 and 2, right? It was indeed a pleasure to the Almighty that Job was righteous. You see, we know this from the first two chapters. And according to those first two chapters, it was, hey, look, he asked in verse three, or is it a gain to him that you make your ways blameless? Well, based on chapters one and two, we would have to say yes. You see, earlier, as we spoke about way back in Job chapter 11, Zophar objected to Job's complaint on what we might call the grounds of Calvinistic or Reformed theology. Basically saying, listen, Job, you're just depraved, you're reprobate, God doesn't owe you anything. Matter of fact, God owes you far worse than you have already received. But here, Eliphaz takes up an argument among similar lines. It was as if he said this, Job, God is sovereign and self-existent. He needs nothing of you and owes you absolutely nothing. God takes no pleasure in your imperfect righteousness, and it's no gain to him that you're considered blameless. Now listen, there's certainly some merit in that theology put in the correct context. But it does not apply to every context, and it did not apply to Job in this context. Verse 4. Is it because of your fear of him that he corrects you and enters into judgment with you? Is not your wickedness great and your iniquity without end? Isn't that powerful right there? Eliphaz is insisting, oh, Job, so you're telling me that the reason why you're undergoing this is because you're so holy. Now, you know what's funny about that? What do we know from Job's chapter, Job chapters one and two? Yes, that is the reason why. But that suggestion to the ears of Eliphaz and Zophar and Bildad, it seems laughable. Eliphaz pressed the home, pressed the point, I should say, home to Job. Surely the catastrophe that came upon Job, which Eliphaz lightly called, listen to what Eliphaz called the catastrophe that came upon Job, correction. Is it because of your fear of him that he corrects you? Listen, think of all the things that happened to Job, right? He lost 10 children in one afternoon. He lost everything he owned. He became a, a penniless beggar, you know, in just a few moments. He, he lost the support of his wife. He lost his health. He, he, he found his friends no longer supportive, but argumentative against him. And greatest of all, he lost his sense of fellowship with God. And now Eliphaz says, correction. It rolls pretty easily off your tongue, doesn't it, Eliphaz? It didn't happen to you. But anyway, he says that this did not come, Job, because you feared God. It came because your wickedness was great and your iniquity was without end. 
Again, now starting out verse six, he says, for you have taken pledges from your brother for no reason and stripped the naked of their clothing. And going on now, and you've not given the weary water to drink and you've withheld bread from the hungry, but the mighty man possessed the land and the honorable man dwelt in it. You've sent widows away empty and the strength of the fatherless was crushed. Therefore, snares are all around you and sudden fear troubles you or darkness that you cannot see and an abundance of waters covers you. Do you see what Elias is saying to Job here? He's calling Job out for all of his wickedness. Did you see the things he accuses Job of here? Look at all he accuses him. He says, you've taken pledges from your brother for no reason and have stripped the naked of their clothing. That's verse six. And then he says, you've not given the weary water to drink. You've withheld the bread from the hungry. The mighty man has possessed the land and the honorable man dwelt in it, but you've sent away the widow empty. Do you see all these accusations? Job, You've done all these wicked things. Now listen, this is what we know about Job and his life. He did no such thing. Job was not like this. Now, I I, I want to tell you something, and just to put it in the bigger context of the book of Job. You would think that in the next chapter, when Job answers Eliphaz, that he would defend his own life, right? That he would say, wait a minute, let me tell you about the kind of life I lived. I want you to know something. Job does not defend his own life until chapter 31. I am absolutely amazed at how humble Job was and how long he delayed defending his own life and explaining the kind of life that he lived. He he didn't answer these kind of accusations directly for a long, long time, all the way until chapter 31. And I'll tell you, these were terrible accusations that he could make against Job. He accused Job mainly of greed and cruelty for the sake of riches. Now, none of it was true. But Eliphaz assumed that it was true because Job was once rich and now he was poor. The only evidence that he could think could be true to explain Job's condition was that, well, he must have been a dishonest man. He became rich at the expense of other people. He was greedy and cruel. And that's why he says in verse 10, therefore snares are all around you and sudden fear troubles you. Eliphaz again stated the simple formula that dominated the analysis of Job's friends. You sin, Job. That's why all this came upon you. Now, if he attacked Job's character in the previous verses, now he's going to start attacking Job's theology. Look at it here, starting at verse 12. He says, Is not God in the height of heaven? And see the highest stars, how lofty they are. And you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the deep darkness? Thick clouds cover him so that he cannot see, and he walks above the circle of heaven. Will you keep to the old way which wicked men have trod, who were cut down before their time, whose foundations were swept away by a flood? They said to God, depart from us. What can the Almighty do to them? Yet he filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of the wicked is far from me. The righteous see it and are glad, and the innocent laugh at them. Surely our adversaries are cut down, and the fire consumes the remnant. Now here, Eliphaz is hoping once again to give Job basic theological instruction. Verse 12, is not God in the height of heaven? He said, listen, Job, you won't admit your error. Therefore, you must be fundamentally wrong in your understanding of God. You you must think that God can't see the wickedness that you did before. Again, once you follow the premise of the thinking of Job's friends, it's all very logical. Job has secret sin that he's hiding. He must not think that God can see it. He must have a very low view of what God is. Therefore, I must instruct Job in the greatness of God. And then in verse 15, he gives him this encouragement to repent. Will you keep to the old way which wicked men have trod? You see, listen, here Eliph has warned Job not to harden his heart and not to harden his mind in the way that those did who were swept away by a flood in verse 16. This is possibly an obscure reference to the flood in Noah's time. I I think that the book of Job took place. I can't prove it. It's just my estimation. But it's my sense that the book of Job happened, the events in it, not many generations after the flood. 
And so here, uh, Eliphaz is discussing this phenomenon here. He says, listen, remember how it was in the days of the flood. And Eliphaz warned Job not to follow in the wickedness of those people who lived before the time of the flood. And so being almost sarcastic, he asks Job, do you plan on continuing in the way of the wicked? You're going in the wrong direction, Job. Don't continue to go there because God will judge it just like he judged the people in the flood. Now, when God brings this judgment, notice what he says in verse 19. He says that when God brings judgment, the righteous see it and are glad. You see, when God brings judgment, the righteous rejoice. And this is again used as another club to beat Job with. Job, God is judging you. If you were really righteous, you'd be happy about it. Do you see how they keep turning things upon Job? Do you sense how frustrated Job must be with all of this? You see, this was another way for Eliphaz to say that Job was wicked and not righteous because he did not rejoice in the judgments of God. And so now, starting at verse 21, Eliphaz is going to be counselor to Job once again. Tell him what he should do. He says, get yourself right with God, Job. Notice verse 21. Now, acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. Thereby, good will come to you. Receive, please, instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. You will remove iniquity far from your tents. Then you will lay your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brooks. Yes, the Almighty will be your gold and your precious silver. For then you will have your delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. You will make your prayer to him and he will hear you and you will pay your vows. You will also declare a thing and it will be established for you. So light will shine on your ways. When they cast you down, you will say exultation will come. Then he will save the humble person. He will even deliver the one who is not innocent. Yes, he will be delivered by the purity of your hands. Now again, verse 21, he's giving Job this basic advice. Now acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. Thereby good will get to know. You know what it means to acquaint yourself with him? He's saying, now Job, just get to know God and things will be better. Again, I just want you to understand how absolutely frustrating this must have been for Job. This man who walked so closely to God and now desperately, more than anything, just wanted to sense the presence of God again. I wouldn't blame Job if tears were steaming, streaming down his face when he heard this. He's saying, acquaint yourself with him. I've been trying to, to, to sense the presence of God since this whole calamity happened. You, you act like it's so easy, Eliphaz. If it says, well, I'll just go repent. And God will, but he goes, you don't understand at all. It's very painful to see how greatly his friends, even though they weren't bad men, but how greatly they misunderstood Job's situation and how ineffective they were in their counsel to him. But I want you to know something here. If you take those verses that I just read to you, and remove them from Job's context and put them into the context of someone who really is a sinner and needs to repent. It's marvelous counsel. It's really good counsel. It's just put in the wrong context. You see, this was great advice for Job, assuming that the problem was sin in Job's life. If it wasn't sin in Job's life, then it's rotten advice. But if it was, it would have been great advice. Now, again, this is a wonderful picture of the blessings that come to the person who returns to God. They don't fit the situation of Job, but um, it it is really eloquent the way Eliphaz um, explains this. He says, verse 26, for then you will have your delight in the Almighty. Just return to God, Job, and you'll delight in the Almighty again. Now, again, if you take it from Job's situation, if you could say this to a sinner, you'd say, yes, you've been afraid of God. You haven't thought of God. You you think God hates you. Listen, if you'll just turn to him, you will have your delight in the Almighty. Now, Eliphaz assumed much because Job was agonizing with God instead of finding delight in him. But Job's agony with God was a real, although a very temporary phenomenon. It's interesting that he says right there in verse 26, and lift up your face to God. I find it interesting, Charles Spurgeon preached a great 
sermon on this text. He took it out of its context. I mean, he explained that he was doing this. And he was saying, I know that Eliphaz was given mistaken counsel to Job, but if we take these words of Eliphaz and turn them towards a sinner who's seeking God, it's amazingly good counsel. Lift up your face to God. What does it mean to lift up your face to God? Spurgeon explained. He said, first of all, it means to have joy in God. You know, when you're miserable, your face hangs down, doesn't it? That's the attitude of misery. But when our thoughts are on God, when our relationship with God is beautiful and strong and flesh, then our faces are lifted up to God in a glorious radiance. He also said that when you lift up your face to God, it means that your guilt is put away, right? Doesn't guilt make you hang your head down? Your conscience makes your head seem heavy upon your shoulders. You don't want to lift up your face. But when your guilt is taken away, your face is once again lifted up to God. To lift up your face to God, Spurgeon explained next, it means to be free from fear. Fear makes you cover your face. Fear makes you hide yourself. But when you're right with God, you can lift up your face to God once again. And then he explained fourthly that it means to have expectation right? When you expect something, you lift up your face to God. And he says, this is the place of the believer, the person who is right with God, that they have joy in God, they have guilt put away, that they're free from fear, and now they have a glorious expectation from God. You know, it's funny, we, we look at Eliphaz and he goes, man, you're a good preacher. You're just preaching to the wrong audience. You've got a great message. You're just preaching it to Job when you should be preaching it to somebody else. As he explains here in verse 28, so light will shine on your ways. And then in verse 21, and he will save the humble person. Let's just remind ourselves. For Eliphaz and his friends, the equation was rather simple. All Job needed to do was to confess the deep and great sins that brought this whole calamity upon his life, and then he would receive God's restoration. And again, I want you to notice something else. Job's friends seem to emphasize his material losses, his financial losses. Job always seemed to emphasize his spiritual losses. Those were the things that weighed most heavily upon Job's heart. So there, with the end of this chapter, we end the words of Eliphaz the Temanite. Say goodbye to Eliphaz. You're not going to hear of any more, hear of him anymore. We, we already, at the end of round two, we heard the last of Zophar because Zophar doesn't speak in round three. But now Eliphaz, beginning round three, you're not going to hear from him anymore. He's silent, although I'll give you a little tickler. I'll tickle you about this and you can think about it later. Here, Eliphaz will be mentioned in the last chapter of the book of Job in a very interesting way. So goodbye, Eliphaz. Now in the next two chapters that we're going to consider this evening, Job is going to answer Eliphaz in, in his speech. We're familiar with this pattern, right? The friends speak, and then Job answers them. So here we go. Verse, chapter 23, verse 1. Then Job answered and said, Even today my complaint is bitter. My hand is listless because of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in his great power? No, but he would take note of me. There the upright could reason with him and I would be delivered forever from my judge. See how Job puts it there in verse 2? Even today, my complaint is bitter. At the close of Eliphaz's speech, Job continued to feel desperate. I can just imagine, I can picture the whole scene in my mind. Eliphaz, very eloquent in his speaking, concludes his speech. Again, what's the theme? It's the same theme as all of the friends' speech. Get right with God, Job, and then things will be better. He concludes his speech. He hopes he's persuaded Job. He smiles and he goes, well, Job, what do you think about that? Are you ready to repent? And then Job just says, even today, my complaint is bitter. No, I don't get it at all, Eliphaz. That the wisdom and the counsel of Eliphaz and the others was of no relief to him. And in fact, it just made his mental and spiritual agony all the worst. That's why he cries out in verse 3, Oh, that I knew where I might find him. Isn't this fascinating to you? 
You know, Eliphaz just presented it so simple. Oh, Job, just return to God. And Job is pulling out his hair. Where do I find him? You, you act like it's simple. But I feel that God has removed his presence from me. I feel like I'm alone in this universe. Again, I, I, I've said this before in our previous studies, but we find a similarity between the agony of Jesus on the cross and what Job suffered. There, there was a blameless man. Of course, Jesus was perfectly blameless and sinless, and, and Job was just a blameless and, and, and upright on a human level, not on a divine level. Where I'm trying to say that, that Job was Jesus, but there's a similarity. There's a fellowship of their suffering, so to speak. And just as much as Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt utterly forsaken of God the Father on the cross, that's how Job feels. So he cries out, oh, that I knew where I might find him. Job felt separated from God. Again, I want to remind you, this wasn't the first crisis in Job's life. Although, of course, it went far beyond any previous crisis he had suffered. Job knew what it was. I mean, we can just imagine, he had 10 children growing up. Don't you think ever, any of those children ever became deathly sick? And Job had to pace back and forth, crying out to God, Oh God, what will you do? But even in those moments of despair, as dark and as gloomy as they were, Job felt the presence of God. Now, in the midst of this crisis, he doesn't know where to find him. Before, he had found comfort and solace in God. But now, in this catastrophe, he felt that he could not find God. And again, I just want to make this, this sense to you that in a way almost infinitely less, though nevertheless real, Job experienced what Jesus experienced on the cross. Here was a man who had previously been in the fellowship and favor of God. Now he felt utterly forsaken. This was the greatest source of torment in Job's life. You know, we talk about that sometimes when we consider Jesus' sufferings on the cross, don't we? You can talk about Jesus' physical sufferings, right? Have you ever heard a teaching on the physical sufferings of Jesus on the cross? It's horrible. It's agonizing. You think that the cross must reach close to the epitome of human pain that a person could endure. And then other people will talk about the sufferings that Jesus endured on a psychological level, and I'm sure that those were great as well. But we all know, don't we? that the greatest suffering that Jesus endured on the cross was spiritual. It's the same way with Job. Yes, he experienced great suffering with, with, with his body. Yes, he experienced great suffering with all kinds of things. But by far, the greatest suffering that he endured, it was spiritual. And so now he goes on here, verse 4. He says, listen, what I would want to do is I would present my case before him. You see, Job didn't only want the sense of the presence of God for the sense of spiritual comfort. He also wanted the sense of the presence of God so that he could be vindicated in the court of God, especially in the face of his accusations uh, that came to him from his friends. Do you see what Job's saying? He's saying, God, I want to know you're there. Not just so I can have the comfort of your presence, but I want you to, to try my case and to prove to my friends that I'm not the man that they think I am. And he goes on in verse 5, I would know the words which he would answer me. And then in verse 7, I would be delivered forever from my judge. Job has very great confidence in his conscience, assuring him that he would find mercy and favor at the throne of God. His friends insisted that God was against Job in his sufferings, but Job stubbornly clung to his own innocence. So now, starting here in verse 8, Job confesses his lack of understanding. He says, verse 8, Look, I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. He sense the frustration in Job, right? I go forward, backward, left hand, right hand. Job insisted that he had sat, got, sought God in the midst of his crisis. He looked in every direction. I looked in front of me. He's not there. I looked behind me. I can't see him. I looked to the left, to the right. Nowhere can I find him. And by the way, don't you think that this is a glorious mark of a true child of God? Job still longed for the presence of God. Isn't that a beautiful thing? That Job is still crying out for the presence of God, even though he feels that God has bruised him. 
Even though he feels that God has well nigh broken him, shattered him, he still longs for his presence. What a glorious evidence. The fact that he is a true child of God. And yet in verse 9, he says, I've looked every direction, but he's not there. I cannot perceive him. No matter how sincerely and how diligently Job looked, he could not find God. God remained hidden through a barrier that was impossible to pierce. Now look, I made the likeness once before about Job's suffering and the suffering of Jesus on the cross. And I want to take that just a little bit further. Because though we must say that Jesus absolutely felt forsaken by his father, you cannot say that there was an absolute division between the father and the son on the cross. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us in one of his Corinthian letters, what does he tell us? He tells us that God the father was in Christ at the cross, reconciling himself. Isn't that amazing? Now listen, I believe that Jesus felt utterly forsaken by the Father, but at the same time, that that great union between Father and Son that makes up the Godhead, it was not severed. The sense of it was severed from Jesus Christ, but not the actual fact of it. I think it's the same way with Job. Do you see here the sustaining hand of Job? Do you see here that God is still there? God in his hidden hand is still, Job can't sense it. And that's what is agonizing Job. He can't sense any support from God, but God is still supporting him there nonetheless, still drawing Job to seek him. It's kind of funny. You know, Job here is crying out, oh God, won't you support me? Won't you help me? And at that time, in a way that Job could not feel, but was nonetheless real, God was supporting. God was strengthening him. He would have perished. I think he would have killed himself if it was not for the support of God in those times. So now his confidence in the midst of despair. Here we come to another one of those blight flashes of light in the midst of Book of Job, right? Are you ready for it? It's been dark. Here, ready for a flash? Verse 10. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Again, it's one of those great flashes, right? We want to stand up and applaud Job, right? We go, yes, Job, you're right there. He knows the way that I think. You know what he says? He goes, God, I can't feel you. I've looked forward and backward and left and right. I can't sense you anywhere, but I still know your eyes are on me. You know the way that I take. And then he gives that great statement in verse 10. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Isn't that beautiful? Again, we're just so impressed with these flashes that come from Job. And listen, we understand, right? We read this and we go, oh, Job. You're going to sink back into despair pretty quick again. But we're just so happy for these flashes of of just Holy Spirit inspiration in Job. Job admitted that he could not get through to God, yet he clung to the confidence that God was still managing over this crisis. With a very wonderful faith, Job seemed at this fleeting instant to understand that he could and should in the present crisis do exactly what was right. He understood that God observed Job carefully and had not forgotten him, right? He said, he knows the way that I take. He understood that God had a purpose in the crisis and the purpose was not to punish Job. Do you see what he said there in verse 10? When he has tested me, he understands it perfectly. And then he goes on to say that God would one day bring the trial to an end. He says, I shall come forth as gold right there in verse 10. And then he understood that God would bring something good from it all. Um, I shall come forth as gold. And then he said that he understood that God still valued Job. You know, you don't put junk metal through the fire, do you, right? You're not worried about uh, refining it, purifying it. You only purify precious metals. He understood that God still considered him gold, and that's why he was receiving these fires of affliction. Let me read to you a quote from G. Campbell Morgan here. He says, Suddenly, in the midst of bitter complaining, there flamed out the most remarkable evidence of the tenacity of his faith. He declared with conviction that God knew the way he was taking 
He even affirmed his confidence that it was God who was trying him and that presently he would come forth from the process as gold. That's exactly how Job felt at this moment. And so Job here speaks with just wonderful, wonderful confidence at this moment. And we rejoiced in it. Matter of fact, he, he'll even continue with his testimony in verse 11, where he says, my foot has held fast to his steps. This was a dramatic defense of his integrity before his accusing friends. The, the friends declared that Job, uh, if he had followed God, if he had loved his word, he had never been in this situation. But, but Job says, I have followed God. You notice what he said? I've kept to his way. And then he said, I've loved his word. I have treasured the words of his mouth in verse 12. And so here it's a beautiful thing that Job has this assurance in his heart. And now he continues on, verse 13. But he's unique, and who can make him change? And whatever his soul desires, that he does. For he performs what is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Therefore, I am terrified at his presence. When I consider this, I am afraid of him. For God made my heart weak, and the Almighty terrifies me, because I was not cut off from the presence of darkness, and he did not hide deep darkness from my face. In verse 13, when Job says, but he's unique and who can make him change? Job here argued back against himself, against his great declaration of faith. He said, listen, God, I do trust you. I do know that you're refining me. But you know what? I can't make you do anything. If you don't want to do this, I can't make you. And then he goes on in verse 14. He performs what's appointed to for me, and many such things are with him. God, you're going to do what you please in my life. And you're not going to be held hostage to my demands. You know what I see here? I see Job coming closer and closer to the place God wanted him to be in this crisis. He comes closer and closer to realizing that God can be trusted, that God does in fact love Job and care for him, but at the same time, God is sovereign, and at least some of his ways are beyond his knowing. I see Job coming more and more to this place, and that's why he says in verse 15, therefore I was terrified at his presence, God has made my heart weak. You see, knowing the might and the power and the sovereignty of God it made Job appreciate the distance that was between himself and God. It made him feel a good and righteous awe of God, even though it felt like deep darkness. And it was a little comfort to him in this crisis. And so now Job continues on in his answer to Eliphaz in Job chapter 24. He says, verse 1, Since times are not hidden from the Almighty, why do those who know him see not his days? Now, you know what? I have to admit, this is a difficult verse to understand. This is one of those verses that the translators have a difficult time with. Maybe one of those obscure things where the Hebrew is just so ancient, or maybe there's a little bit of dispute about what the actual text is. It's hard to know exactly what Job is getting at in this sentence. It seems to be this is the sense. Since God knows and will judge everything, why are the godly kept in the dark about his ways? Now, if that's what Job meant, this had special application to the question that Job is going to address in the rest of this chapter. The question Job will address in the rest of this chapter is the seeming prosperity of the wicked. The NIV translates the verse like this. It says, why does the Almighty not set times for judgment? Why must those who know him look in vain for such days? Or the New Living Translation has this. Why doesn't the Almighty open the court and bring judgment? Why must the godly wait for him in vain? In other words, Job's wondering here, okay, Eliphaz and all the rest of you, you've been raising these questions that, that, that God judges the ungodly and he blesses the godly. And therefore, you have concluded that I am ungodly because I seem to be under the judgment of God. But Job says, you know what? It's not that simple because there's a lot of ungodly people who don't seem to have much trouble in their life. That's basically the theme of this judgment. And it seems that chapter, excuse me, verse one of chapter 24 is Job raising this question, this dilemma. And then he goes on here, starting at verse two. He says, this is the conduct of the ungodly. Some remove landmarks. 
They seize flocks violently and feed on them. They drive away the donkey of the fatherless. They take the widow's ox as a pledge. They push the needy off the road. All the poor of the land are forced to hide. Indeed, like wild donkeys in the desert, they go out to their work searching for food. The wilderness yields food for them and for their children. They gather the fodder in the field and gleaned in the vineyards of the wicked. They spend the night naked without clothing and have no covering in the cold. They are wet with the showers of the mountains and huddle around the rock for want of shelter. Here, Job describes the mostly financial sins of the wicked, that their financial sins are rooted in greed and cruelty. Now, let's remember, back in chapter 22, Eliphaz said that Job's calamity came upon him because he acted this way towards other people. And he said, Job, your riches were gained by greed and wickedness. Do you remember those accusations that Eliphaz made against Job? But here, Job is agreeing with Eliphaz that this is how wicked people act. But he's not agreeing with him that Job himself acted this way. And so he says, look at how the wealthy and the wicked abuse and and take advantage of the poor. He goes on with the same thought, starting at verse 9. He says, some snatch the fatherless from the breast and take a pledge from the poor. They cause the poor to go naked without clothing, and they take away the sheaves from the hungry. They press out oil within their walls and tread wine presses, yet suffer thirst. The dying groan in the city and the souls of the wounded cry out, yet God does not charge them with wrong. Now, in this very vivid description, Job describes the heartless oppression inflicted upon the poor by the godless. You see what he says there in verse 9? Some snatch the fatherless from the breast and take a pledge from the poor. Can you just see the old wicked, greedy man, you know, the guy in the top hat and the coat, and he's going, you know, the real, you know, Scrooge kind of person, going and, and taking candy from the baby's mouth, right? I'll take that from you. That's mine, little boy. You know, just picture the cruelty of this greedy, greedy person. And Job says here in verse 12, do you get the, the, the gist of it here at verse 12? Yet God does not charge them with wrong. After describing the great wickedness of these greedy, godless people, Job then says, you know, I don't see God punishing them. God does not seem to charge them with wrong. It didn't bother Job that there were wicked people in the world. He could understand that. But what bothered him was what he says right there in verse 12. Yet God does not charge them with wrong. That's how it seemed to Job. God, what are you doing? God, excuse me, Job was pleading with God to do something about these wicked people. He says in verse 12, it's very picturesque. Doesn't he say that? He says, the dying groan in the city. And God, you seem to do nothing. Well, continuing on the same theme, Job's going to pick it up in verse 13 here. He says, there are those who rebel against the light, who do not know its ways, nor abide in its paths. The murderer rises with the light. He kills the poor and needy. And in the night, he's like the thief. The eye of the adulterer waits for twilight, saying, no eye will see me. And he disguises his face. In the dark, they break into houses, which they mark for themselves in the daytime. They do not know the light, for the morning is the same to them as the shadow of death. If someone recognizes them, they are in the terrors of the shadow of death. See, verse 13, in this continuing description of the wicked, he says, there are those who rebel against the light. And in this passage, using very powerful poetic images, Job describes the kind of sin that happens under the cover of darkness. Darkness is used as a cloak for the murderer in verse 14, for the thief in verse 14, and for the adulterer in verse 15. And we can just imagine this, right? The murderer, the thief, and the adulterer, they like to do their sinning in the dark, don't they? Not out in the light. It's kind of interesting. It's almost as if Job anticipated the later instruction of the Apostle Paul. And I would never say that Job read the Apostle Paul. Obviously, Paul came many, many centuries after Job. But listen to what Paul said in Romans 13. He said, The night is far spent. 
The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Job's here describing the sins done in the dark. And look at how he describes it here. Very poetic, very powerful. Verse 17 For the morning is the same to them as the shadow of death. For those who love the darkness, for those who love the sins that are done in the darkness, they regard morning, which we should regard the morning as good, right? (laughs) Rational people are happy for the morning, not these sinners. They regard the morning as the coming of a dark night. The morning is the same to them as the shadow of death. The morning to them is a bad thing, not a good thing. And so Job here now in verse 18, I picture him almost wanting to give some advice to God now. God, if you want to know what you should do with the wicked, let me tell you what you should do. You don't seem to be doing what what you should do to the wicked, God. I want you to, again, understand the bigger context of this. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, they all spelled it out to Job in a very easy equation, right? Job. The godly are rewarded by God, and the ungodly are punished. You are being punished. Therefore, you're ungodly. Now, what Job is trying to say is, guys, it's not that simple. I see a lot of wicked people who don't seem to be very punished. Your, your equation, your uh, you know, moral mathematics don't work out so well. And so now Job is going to, after bringing up the the, the example of all these wicked and ungodly people, now Job is going to tell God what he should do with them. Verse 18, he said, they should be swift on the face of the waters. Their portion should be cursed in the earth so that no one would turn into the way of their vineyards as drought and heat consume the snow waters. So the grave consumes those who have sinned. The womb should forget him. The worm should feed sweetly on him. He should be remembered no more, and wickedness should be broken like a tree. For he who preys on the barren who do not bear and does no good for the widow. Isn't that powerful? God, I'll tell you what you should do to the wicked. I'll tell you what you should do to those greedy people who would snatch the candy from the child's hand. He says, verse 18, their portion should be cursed in the earth. He's wondering why God does not judge the wicked the way that he should. Again, it seems to me like Job is giving advice to God on how he should judge the wicked. Mainly, here's the idea. Job understood that the wicked may be judged in the life to come. Okay? But for Job, for somehow that wasn't good enough for him right now. (laughs) He wanted them to be judged right now. Come on, God. Great, you tell me, yeah, you know, in eternity they'll be judged. For some reason, that wasn't satisfying to Job. He says, I'm having it hard right now. They should be having it hard right now. You got to admit what he says in verse 20. Pretty picturesque, right? The worms should feed sweetly on him. Can you picture a bunch of happy worms eating the decomposing body of a wicked man? Job got that picture in his mind and he smiled, right? They should be sweet worm food. That's what should happen to the wicked. And he should be remembered no more. You see, Job wasn't against the idea of the wicked being punished after death. He's like, thank God, if you want to punish them after death, fine. But do it now also. They should get it now as well. And that's his idea here. So verse 22, he says, but God draws the mighty away with his power. He rises up, but no man is sure of life. He gives them security and they rely on it. Yet his eyes are on their way, and they're exalted for a little while. Then they're gone. They're brought low. They're taken out of the way like all others. They dry out like the heads of grain. Now, if it is not so, who will prove me a liar and make my speech worth nothing? Can you see Job standing up before his friends and saying that? Come on now. You know it's like this. Job considered, verse 22, that God draws the mighty away with his power. Now, the mighty, he means the, the mighty in wickedness, right? The mighty, wicked man. God draws him away with his power. Job considered that, that perhaps the fate of the wicked in the world beyond was going to be enough to, to make it balance out on the scales of divine justice. Yet the wicked does seem to prosper in this life. He says he rises up 
At the same time, no man is sure of life. Uh, to be honest here, Job is going back and forth in his mind. I, I don't think he can figure this out. He's frustrated by the fact that well, the, the, the wicked are going to be judged eventually. Sometimes it seems like they get it in this life, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they seem to prosper. God, I don't know how this works out. I mean, you and I, maybe you have agonized over the same questions. Remember that the psalmist did. He said, you know, I almost stumbled when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have it so good. I, I, I didn't, you know, uh, I, they, they don't seem to have any problems in life. And it seems like the worse they are, the, the easier their life is. And then he says, and then I went into the house of the Lord and understood their end. Now that answer was satisfying for the psalmist. It did not fully satisfy Job, not in the midst of his difficulty. Verse 23, he says, he gives them security and they rely on it, yet his eyes are on their ways. Job was reminding himself that God was not blind to the sins of the wicked. And even if they did seem to prosper well enough in this life, soon enough they would be gone and brought low. The sense from Job is that God allows such prosperity to some of the wicked to increase their ultimate judgment. He does indeed give them security and they rely on it. But in the end, they end up like dry heads of grain. Now, what happens to dry heads of grain? They get cut down and harvest, right? That's what happens to them. And that's what Job is anticipating. Listen, the whole point of it is this. The whole uh, uh, point of Job in this chapter and in this answer to Eliphaz is he says, Eliphaz and all you guys, you're building your case against me on these moral mathematics. These moral mathematics that simply say, I am a sinner because of this calamity that's come in my life. You need to understand that it's not so simple as that. And therefore, he stands up, verse 25, at the end of this chapter, and simply says, if it is not so, who will prove me a liar? Job challenged all men, all of his friends, to contradict what he affirmed. He said, listen, the righteous may indeed suffer more than the wicked in this world, and you know it. God, in the end, will justify his own. But you know in this world, sometimes the righteous suffer more than the wicked and you all know it. Now, what could his friends answer to that? The answer to that is not much. Next week, when we get into chapter 25, six verses. Now, I think it's going to two things. First of all, Job's friends just realize that they're not getting through to him, right? It's not working. Secondly, they're realizing that maybe they are in the wrong and Job is making sense. Thirdly, I think everybody's just exhausted. And that's why I think if you really want to understand the book of Job, you have to let it exhaust you. You have to get through these middle chapters that are just wearying, where it's just blah, 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 back and forth, back and forth. Because what we are doing is we are preparing ourselves for the glorious appearance of the Lord in chapter 38. And God is not going to appear until all of human wisdom and all of human eloquence is exhausted. And we're getting there. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Next week, we'll pick it up again at chapter 25 and come to the conclusion of the third round and then Job's defense. But, but let's just take this, right? We can conclude by reminding ourselves from some of the glorious portions of this, where Job spoke with such power in chapter 24, right? We, we really love that, where he said in that very verse, he says, um, verses 10, 11, he knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. I think slowly, in small ways, Job is getting through this. I see him making small steps towards being in the right place. And it won't all be corrected until God speaks. But slowly and surely, he's coming into the right place. We see in him the marks of a true child of God, that even though everything seems dark, he feels God's presence is far from him. At the same time, he loves God and he longs for the presence, even though he can't feel it. I hope that's us in the midst of our trials as well. Father, um, we do pray that tonight. We pray that uh, in the midst of our trials, that these trials would press us closer to you, Lord, not drive us from you. 
that they would make us cling even tighter to who you are and what you want to do in our life. Lord, none of us here tonight have experienced misery or catastrophe to the same extent as Job. But Lord, in our own ways, we have faced trials and we will face trials. And we pray that you would give us an abiding confidence in you, even as we see you building in Job in the midst of this, Lord. Help us to learn from Job and to be able to say uh, sooner than the 23rd chapter, he knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. We pray this, Lord, in, in Jesus' name. Amen.